Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome to episode 13 of Lessons Learned. I'm Dylan. I'm Evan. Uh, today we're going to be talking about two requirements for survival, making assumptions and manipulating the world. All right, so today we're talking about survival and manipulating the world and making assumptions, mm -hmm. which I would assume are generally bad things, but yeah, there's got to be a good way to go about this, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty much, what we're going through is chapter four, by the way, we're in chapter four, mm -hmm. um, finally. This is the kind of introduction to the chapter, but it's a very long introduction. And he's talking about these things called paradigms and axioms. Um, and they're pretty much, he's saying that the assumptions that we make are assumptions that we have to make. So it's definitely not a bad thing. It's a okay. necessity. So our first quote, uh, good luck. A paradigm is a complex cognitive tool who whose use presupposes acceptance of a limited number of axioms or definitions of what constitutes reality for the purposes of argument and action whose interactions produce an internally consistent explanatory and predictive structure. You should be proud of me. I, I, I'm, I, if you asked me to explain it, I'd struggle, Uh huh. but I, I, I got, I think the general Good. gist. Good. So I'm getting smarter <laughs> pretty much <clears throat> what it's saying is it, you, a paradigm is this tool that we all use, uh, and it presupposes certain things in order to act um, okay. because what the axioms do is they create an internally consistent explanatory and predictive nature. Right. So like one of those things that we have that you could call an, I guess an axiom is like gravity. Okay. That's something we just like assume will be working. So if that's an axiom and I already forget the other word paradigm pa paradigm. So what would be a paradigm to gravity? Um, I don't know. They it's use a different tough example. stuff. There are more yeah. examples that okay. he has that I'll be using. Okay, perfect. But for understanding the axiom part, mm -hmm. I think gravity is a kind of way to do it. And gravity is a little bit different just because we know it exists. Yeah. And it's less of an assumption. But the assumption would be, I guess, that it will continue to keep working. So an axiom is just an assumption that we have to make. In order to do other things. Right. So like... I have to make the, while I'm driving down the road, I have to make the assumption that the guy on the other side of the road will stay not over on my side of the road. Yeah. Like I have to make the assumption that that line that's painted is actually going to keep us from hitting each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. And then like I, a paradigm is a whole set of these. Okay. So if, if you wanted to look at maybe a Christian paradigm, mm -hmm. which would ours, the assumptions are God exists. Okay. Human nature is sinful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Satan exists. Jesus died for us. Yeah. Okay. All these things would be axiomatic claims mm -hmm. for the Christian paradigm. Okay. So you can call it a Christian paradigm. I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> so you could also say like, like there's a driving paradigm. I assume that everybody's going to go the, the speed limit. Mm -hmm. So I, we're not slowed down or somebody's going to rear end me. Yeah. If you want to assume over. that people will drive how they're supposed to. I mean, I'm not going to assume I drive <laughs> the way I'm supposed to. I drive safe. I just don't, um, uh, speed limits. Yeah. Their recommendations is what they are. They are. Okay. That makes sense. So, okay. Uh, something else he says about the, the paradigms or kind of the axioms, the assumptions and stuff. Mm -hmm. He says they amount to the same thing as faith from a within the paradigm perspective. So mm -hmm. you're kind of taking these things on faith. Yeah, you are. Well, uh, just like I said, like you're, you put faith in other human beings, especially mm -hmm. when you're driving like on the expressway. Yeah. Or like in Michigan, there's a lot of, um, when you start going up North, mm -hmm. there's a lot of roads where the speed limit's 70 miles an hour and it's one lane down, one lane up. And the only thing separating you is that dotted line. That's right. it. And it's 70 miles an hour. So that, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so that's so cool. So, I mean, like, we have faith in people all the time. We have to, mm -hmm. which goes to, like, why God calls us to love each other. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, in order to function as a society, we have to have faith that we're going to abide by some level of rules. Yeah. 
Exactly. Important things. So I'll give kind of another perspective. Um, he says in some regards, a paradigm is like a game. Mm -hmm. Play is optional. So you don't have to like use the paradigm. Okay. You don't have to use a Christian paradigm if you don't believe. Mm -hmm. uh, play is optional, but once undertaken, must be governed by socially verified rules. So if you're going to buy into this, there's mm -hmm. certain things you're going to have to believe. Right. In order for it to stay consistent and explanatory. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like that makes sense. Yeah. So like he says, these rules cannot be questioned while the game is on, or if they are, that is a different game. Mm. Uh, children arguing about how to play football are not playing football. They're engaging instead in a form of philosophy. Paradigmatic thinking allows for comprehension of an infinity of facts through the application of a finite system of presupposition allows in the final analysis for the limited subject to formulate sufficient provisional understanding of the unlimited experimental object. So pretty much what he's saying with that last sentence is that there is an infinite number of facts that we could focus on. Right. We could technically know an infinite number of things. Right. Because they're all out there. Um, a paradigm gives us a consistent way to narrow that down into a manageable way. Mm. I wonder, and maybe he does tie this in later, because I'm thinking about, like, the entire premise of this book mm -hmm. really has been, where do you place importance? Mm -hmm. And then understanding the difference between chaos and order. And if we have, if there's a little gap, uh, there's something our friend asked me, because he listened to one of the episodes, mm -hmm. and he asked a very good question that I think would be worth discussing. Okay. Um. But real quick to get to my point, um, if if we have to live in these paradigms and stuff, such as like you believe in X, so I wonder if that how that's going to integrate with like our value system where we're placing values and stuff, because like you're going to learn something or buy things for something because you placed importance on it, mm -hmm. but that's given that you believe in X certain things. Mm -hmm. Like I believe it's important to understand how a car works and to be able to fix it in a pinch. So right. that's something that's I believe because, that's important. And then so the like the axiom <laughs> for that, like what you're presupposing there mm -hmm. is that it will be useful to right. know to do those things. Which I, I think most people can assume that it's gonna be useful. Right. But and I'll so but that's basically a good example of how in pretty much anything you do, there are certain assumptions that you're making. Right. And I'll give some other examples of that with like how deep that goes mm -hmm. because there's a lot of assumptions for pretty much everything you do. Wow. So a next quote, however, uh, the postulates themselves are like the axioms okay. uh, must be accepted. Their validity cannot be demonstrated within the confines of the system. So the, the best example I could come up with is, a part of evolution okay so as of now evolution does not prove that a species can evolve into another species which is why it's a theory mm -hmm. right uh, the theory relies upon the axiomatic claim that species can evolve into other theory or into other species so the the theory of evolution is relying on the claim that species can evolve into other species Interesting. So that would be the assumption that someone that believes in evolution uh, or a proponent of evolution would believe. So where does that stop for Christianity? What do you mean? Like if we believe that Jesus was the son of God and he mm -hmm. came and died for our sins, where does that stop? Like where can that not be proved within yeah, Christianity? Within its own self, yeah. Um. I don't know if it works differently with a religion, mm -hmm. except to say that it requires faith. Right. I suppose. Well, because the pastor gave a great sermon and he was talking about the probability of uh, the miracles that Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And didn't he say it was like the guy did the math for if he had done eight of the prophecies, if he had only fulfilled eight out of the hundreds that yeah. he did fulfill. And, and it, was, it like, was like 10 to the power of 17, which is like, didn't he say it was like 10 quadrillion or 100 quadrillion? It was quadrillion. a lot, yeah. It was, yeah, one with 17 zeros behind it mm -hmm. out of one. One out of 10 quadrillion mm -hmm. chance that he does eight out of the hundreds. And then, yeah, there's That's, like 332 total. 
so I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm getting at? And I guess you have to have like faith, but also like, I feel like you start deteriorating what you're going to consider to be true. Yeah. I th- well, So I think that that's super convincing. Yeah. Um, ultimately though, it is not proof in itself. Sure. Because it's just saying that it was super unlikely that it would happen. Well, it's that's eight out of the hundreds. And I like, I know what you're saying is that, well, that's why but, I'm saying it's super convincing, right? But, I would say it's even more convincing considering I, and I don't remember the number for this, but there is a chance mm-hmm. that the atoms in your hand and the atoms with an object line up that your hand passes right. straight. Well, through. and I'm not, like I said, it's very convincing, right. but it doesn't in itself, in itself prove it. It's that's only so convincing. Wild. Uh, so and like we can say like with our experiences that's what proves it right sure but something like the statistics right there wouldn't prove it it just makes it's it very convincing incredibly strong evidence um so we'll keep going and try to parse that out okay for you okay cool um so he talks about the euclidean math okay which is just i think it's pretty much just geometry mm-hmm yeah, a system of Euclidean geometry. Um, so there's like certain assumptions that you would have to assume in order for like geometry to work. Okay. So he lists some of them. Uh, any straight line can be extended indefinitely in a straight line. Right? Yeah. Um, a straight line segment can be drawn by joining any two points. Right. So those are just a couple of examples to give you an idea. Um I guess it's hard for me to wrap my head around it because I like I already take that as just fact. Right, but well, here's here's the part of that. Okay. The Euclidean draws a line connecting two points in the sand, and accepts on faith the sufficiency of that demonstration and the evident certainty of its outcome. So they saw it happen. You could see it happen multiple times. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you are making the assumption that that is always going to happen. Hmm. Because you've seen it happen and you think that's sufficient enough to convince you to think that it'll always be true. Man, we have a lot less faith in Jesus as a society than we do in geometry with unbalanced evidence. Well, and I mean, it, it's it's like, the thing is, it's common sense, right? Yeah. It feels... You can always connect these two things. Right. Why wouldn't it? Yeah, that's how, like, I guess that's why I'm like, Struggling to wrap my head around that. Because mm-hmm. it just makes sense. It, yeah, it just is that way. But the problem is, because you've seen it happen over and over again, mm-hmm. is not proof that it will happen again. Right. So you're just assuming that it will keep happening. Man. <laughs> That's wild. Okay, I get it. Like, I get it. It's still hard to, like, comprehend mm-hmm. in its fullest, you know, yeah. in the fullness of it. But, like, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> like that's dumb <laughs> well so then one that i think we've talked about before to bring it back to evolution since we already talked about it um that's kind of what darwin did with the galapagos finches yeah so he saw them adapt to the environment in certain ways mm-hmm. so he accepted on faith that that would show that it would create substantial changes over time and across species so just like the euclidean saw two points connecting and assumed that that would always happen. Mm -hmm. He saw the Galapagos finches adapting and assumed that that would happen at a greater scale, that that was a thing that would always happen. Right. I, so to clarify about these finches, Mm -hmm. it was one finch that he put on the Island, right? I think, no, it was, he showed up at the Island and there was like a whole culture of finches. I was told in a high school. You have a bad high school. I I know. I'm so I'm giving you my real world experience. Okay. That Darwin. Just so everyone knows, this is a reason right here that we need to reform the high school education system. We need to reform all of the education systems. So this is what I was informed. It was a whole packet that I had to read. It was like twelve pages, and I was bored. Mm-hmm. But it was that Darwin took a bunch of like the same exact finch. And he released them onto the island to let them, like, breed and and populate the island. And that there was no finches there before. And that through the power of evolution, all of these finches 
Mm -hmm. and different parts of the islands bred and evolved to adapt to those different parts of the island. I'm going to double check in for you. I was under the impression that there was no finches and Darwin brought enough finches that they could breed and fill the island and then evolve from there. Um, I thought that they were already there. Well, what were <laughs> I? Th- I thought that he. I thought he brought them there. I thought the whole point was that he brought the same exact finch. Um, because that. Cause... Well, I thought that he saw the. I thought that there was a species of finch there. That he that was already there that was the same. Sure. And then while he was there, he saw it change. Yeah, I guess. I think either way it doesn't matter. Either the either point way is that he yeah. saw the same finch. There was one finch, and then over a long period of time, there were more than one finch. He saw them adapt to right. different environments. Yeah, is that the thing? Is that the study, or is it different? I think that's the basics of it. Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> so yeah, but he saw the changes with the Galapagos finches, and he assumed that that meant that species could also change. From like like dog to cat and cat yes. to dog, yeah, that doesn't make sense. But that's the same sort of axiomatic claim that because it happened once, then it would probably happen with other things. And I mean, it that is true to an extent. Like other creatures also do adapt, sure, to environments and stuff. Right. I mean, but it doesn't talk about like the level of change. Right. I mean, like we as people, like we adapt given our environment. Like we're Humans, I w- I've been informed, not from my school system, but from reading articles, that the human species is wickedly good at adapting. Mm-hmm. And that we have, like, the indomitable human spirit is, like, a legit thing that is, like, really overpowered, ultimately. But, I mean, you know our blood thins when it's hot and our blood thickens when it's cold, right? hmm I'd say it's safe to presume that if you lived in Antarctica, or let's take Alaska, I bet... That all the people that live in Alaska and have always lived there and have a couple generations of kids that generally speaking, their blood is just literally going to be thicker, period. And that even if you brought them to like L.A. or Texas or even Mm -hmm. here in Colorado where it's hot, even then they're going to run really hot all the time. Yeah. I wonder how fast it would change. Yeah, I'm curious. That'd be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Granted, like that's based off of like in it, like. The ability to adapt that we have that can just happen mm-hmm. but i would i would put money on the sense that if you had grown up in only cold climate your body would reduce the uh thinness of blood you can make you know it would just increase in viscosity so like mm-hmm. if this is super thin and this is super thick you'd be shifting down so if you did go to a hot area you would be like maxed out at cooling ability yeah adaption's crazy yeah but that doesn't mean evolving. No. That's just adapting. Yeah. Which is sick. Super cool. And I mean, we credit God for that. We credit God for like making that a thing. But right. You haven't evolved. You you just adapted. Mm-hmm. Something else that's kind of crazy is just how, how different the stuff that God made is compared to the stuff that we make. Mm. We talked about this a while ago and it's like. Well, yeah, and, like, with adaption, we can't make anything that would adapt like that, like robots or anything. Mm -hmm. We'd have to – well, I don't know. I mean, I guess we are pre-fitted with all the adaptions we would need. Right. But it's just done in such a sleek way, I guess. Like, where we were trying to give a robot all of the potential adaptations it would maybe need. Yeah. It would be so unwieldy. Well, I – and, I mean – I would bet that because I've gone from Michigan to Colorado so many times and those temperature differences are just so wild, Mm -hmm. like so wide that I feel like, and maybe I'm just totally wrong. This isn't how it works at all, but I feel like the range in which my blood will thicken and thin is much larger than somebody who's only ever lived in like LA or only ever lived in like tech or like Michigan, like only ever lived in the cold part of Michigan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But like, that's not something I worked on. That's just something that happened as a byproduct. Where mm-hmm. like what you're saying, like we have to program that ability 
it's not going to happen as a byproduct. It's, right. It just has to be there or it's not. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, the only way that it would work if it wasn't already there was a mutation. Yeah. Which would be very lucky to have the right mutation to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'd have to keep mutating right. if you're going back and forth. Yeah. I mutate. I think. I mutate. I'm basically I'm a, like an X-Man. I'm going to just say this. I'm not a scientist. I'm, I do history. I'm so. also not a scientist. I just like blowing things up, um, and playing with fire, but so. that doesn't make me a scientist unless I record the data, which I don't. If any of our details are bad, I apologize, but yeah. I think they're pretty good. I'm trying not to say stuff if I don't think I know it. I mean, this is all about good discussion. Yeah. Good, good hearted discussion. Um, let's quote some Nietzsche real fast. <clears throat> all right, go for it. So. He says, and this is going to hopefully blow your mind a little bit. Let the people suppose that knowledge means knowing things entirely. The philosopher must say no to himself. When I analyze the process that is expressed in the sentence, I think, I find a whole series of daring assertions that would be difficult, perhaps impossible to prove. So he's saying these are the things that you would need to assume are true in order to say, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh where is it? Oh, I lost my paragraph. Okay. Uh, for example, that it is I who think, that there must necessarily be something that thinks, that thinking is an activity and operation on the part of a being who is thought of as a cause, that there is an ego, and finally, that it is already determined what is to be designated by thinking, that I know what thinking is. For if I had not already decided within myself what it is, by what standard could I determine whether that which is just happening is not perhaps willing or feeling? So you don't have to understand all those. Okay. Because that, that's not the point. But the point is, there's all these different things that you would be assuming just by saying that you're thinking something. Like you're assuming that you know what thinking is versus just feeling or willing oh shut the front door <laughs> dude what no but like what you're assuming that it is you that is thinking without proving that See, and i feel like maybe that's my turmoil right now as like an end like as a person growing in their faith mm -hmm. is like Am I the one thinking this? Am I the one who believes this needs to happen and do this? Or is this something that God's pushing on me? Mm -hmm. Or do I think it's God and it's just me? Right. Because there's a difference. And it's not the easiest thing to distinguish. No, and I mean, we've talked about the whisper. Mm. That's what I think Pastor Tim has called it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason does it a lot. Mm -hmm. It was Pastor Jason. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's why it's so important to know God's voice. And to understand what he wants um, and stuff so that you can correctly identify it mm -hmm. when you do hear it. Yeah. And it's not easy, but um, me and uh, our worship pastor, we sat down and he has a friend who is prophetic and has, and he's a much older guy. He's been doing this for decades. Mm -hmm. And he was like, the best way to learn the voice of God, which is what our worship pastor told us mm -hmm. at our, uh, at Zayo. Our college youth group college youth group love him um where he was like when before you go into like a room or if you're in like a store or something just like real quick in your head like god show me something about somebody mm -hmm. and then like if you feel called to a person and you feel that something's about um just like go for it hey da -da 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 -da, which is like weird in a store so he told me like when we did the video conference was like do it in your church um, the prophetic guy, he was like, just do it in your church because it's like a community that would understand what you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, hey, God, like you, if you can just highlight somebody to me and uh, uh, maybe give me some information about them or just something that you you're you're guiding me to do for this person and then walk up and be like, hey, like uh, this might sound crazy, but da, 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 and explain it and just be like, be completely honest with me and ask and. He was like, that's kind of how you gear your tor self towards propheticism because like you're learning how to understand the voice of God and stuff. And 
being open to like receiving information beyond like our mortal understanding Mm -hmm. but it's also a great way to just understand the difference between your own voice and god's voice Mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah because if you're wrong then you're like all right that wasn't the voice of god but if you're right then it's like okay i think i understand yeah it's like drinking different like coffees Mm -hmm. you know it's like well coffee just tastes like coffee and then you try a bunch of different ones and you're like oh this one's kind of like citrusy and this one's like a little more uh robust and this Mm -hmm. one's powerful and this one's light and but you don't know unless you try them like no sweet without sour yeah so that's a good example yeah yeah that's the end speaking of coffee i love i have coffee uh, right here (laughs) i just have water we can talk about um objects now okay so part two of a necessity of survival the first one's assumptions yep this one's manipulation you understand your assumptions at this point i think does that make sense? I assume that I'm assume I assume that I understand uh, assumptions. Cool. That's all it takes. <laughs> um, so first one for objects and manipulating the world. Our representation of objects and let me preface this is probably somewhat review. Okay. But I think he's taking it deeper than he did, and we did that a long time ago. So Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our representations of objects or situations or behavioral sequences are currently accepted as valid because they serve their purpose as tools. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. Do you want me to explain it at all? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the way that we see... Well, I gave an example in my notes of a car. Mm -hmm. Um, As long as your car is working, it's valid to think about that car as a car in essence. And like, that's all it is. It's just a car. Right. However, if your car breaks down, you have to think about the different parts that make up the car to determine what went wrong. Uh, At that point, the car is... The car as a thing that transport you is no longer a valid, mm. um, a, yeah, a valid representation of the object. I do remember talking about this. Okay, and I was blown away because like, it really put in perspective the fact that like I know most parts of a car like in the engine, like I know the valve train and the valves mm-hmm. and the valve springs and push rods and piston rings and stuff. But it's like when I drive a car, I just go pedal go fast, other pedal go stop, mm-hmm. turn turn turn. Yeah. Like, even though I know it all, I don't think about it. Right. Unless I, like, think about it. But then I'm not thinking about, like, driving it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so he's saying the reason that is is because you seeing it as just the thing that moves you around mm-hmm. is a valid way of looking at it for you to do what you're doing. Yeah, because, like, if you thought... If I had to think about the movement of every single valve in piston and, like, everything going on in that engine... Mm-hmm. And it's spinning at 1500 RPM, my brain would explode. Yeah. That'd be a lot. Yeah. Which I remember was the point that we made way earlier was like, we have to simplify objects Mm -hmm. or else like we're not going to comprehend it because it's just going to be too much. Yeah. So now uh, the little bit of a twist he's putting on it Mm -hmm. in this kind of section is the correctness of those assumptions. Okay. And having to change them and that sort of thing. Oh, like adapting. Mm -hmm. our assumptions based on the situation yeah okay so next he says oh and yeah so we talked about cars just to be clear he talks about objects there but he also had in parentheses situations and behavioral sequences um so we assume that certain situations go a certain way um that people are going to act in a certain way Mm -hmm. and we just think about it as a sequence right and that's how we get by. So just to be clear, it's more than just objects. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense because we talked about a while ago that, like, walking up to somebody and saying hi or hello or how are you is because in the past we've received good outputs from that. And we're living under the assumption that I say hi, you say hey, mm-hmm. how are you? I say good, which also elicits a, a positive response. So then I also respond with how are you? Mm-hmm. And then from there, I think we stop making as many or as bold of assumptions because at that point, we're really delving into the unknown. Whoa. Whoa. It all ties together. That's so strange. Jordan Peterson wrote a collective <laughs> book that ties together. Oh, man. Um. Okay. So we understand the different types of representations of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so what he says next is if we can manipulate the... If we can manipulate our models 
in imagination, mm -hmm. apply the solutions so generated to the real world and produce the outcome desired, we presume that our understanding is valid and sufficient. Okay. So as long as you come up with like an idea of how something works mm -hmm. and it goes that way, mm -hmm. it works the way you assumed it would, you're assuming that your understanding is valid and sufficient. Hmm. I wonder how that ties to like a uh, intuition. Hmm. You know what I mean? I think intuition is probably something that comes from experience. Right, but if you if you assume something, mm -hmm. so if you have you know let's say five experience just okay. as a placeholder, and at five experience you make assumptions about things and they actually are pretty right. From there, like so, then fifteen like experience later, your I would say your assumptions are going to be a lot more accurate because you have triple the amount of experience mm -hmm. to go with that assumption but you're only making that assumption based on like intuition mm -hmm. because that's coming from experience mm -hmm. so i'm curious as to like how much that plays how much that plays into um intuition and like what it means to have good intuition yeah well like i said i think part of it comes from experience it absolutely does the important thing here is he's not saying that you're correct mm -hmm. that your understanding is correct <clears throat> he's also not even saying that it is valid and sufficient mm. he's saying that we assume that it's valid and sufficient oh. because it worked for us that time right um which is important to note just just so intuitions in, your intuition is just a strong or weak theory personally yeah probably because like if you have intuition about a situation that you like are very unfamiliar with it's mm -hmm. weak but it's still like a valid theory that technically works given your experience mm -hmm. whereas if you have m much experience intuition says uh, it's probably not only stronger but a lot more valid yeah interesting we're all little scientists walking around aren't we yes <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> So later he says sufficient exploration, which we've talked about before, mm -hmm. but I really liked how he framed it here. And the way we talked about this last time was like going into a cave. You look around in the cave until you figure out that it's not dangerous anymore. Yeah. And like, that's when you figured out that's when you've done sufficient exploration mm -hmm. when there's no longer a threat to you or a potential threat to you. Right. So here he says sufficient exploration is a judgment rendered as a consequence of a sequence of action attaining its desired end what mm -hmm. works is true a procedure is deemed sufficient when it attains its desired end when it meets its goal um so he's just talking about how we define something as being a sufficient amount of exploration right earlier okay. he said what that looked like uh-huh now he's saying here is how you would personally define it is uh when when you go into that cave and you think you've looked around enough, mm -hmm. you're judging that that is sufficient exploration. Right. Which means that maybe it's not sufficient exploration. Right. But you've judged it to be because the thing you wanted to do, you did. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that applies because I mean, how often do you actually go into a cave in real life? But for those that play video games, right. Maybe a little Skyrim. <laughs> mm hmm. Like, I, I know, and this applies to a lot of video games, or even in life experiences, if you're adventurous, um, I know that, like, I'll explore a part of, like, a map, like, thoroughly, like, thoroughly, and, like, way more than most people do. That's why my in-game time is so high, and I still haven't finished the game. But then it's, like, I'll watch somebody else do something, and they, like, I'm, like, how'd you, what? That was there the whole time. I walked mm -hmm. by, it, like, seven times. And then I'm like disappointed, but like it, it proves exactly that I thought I had thoroughly discovered everything that was available. Yeah. And my in game time reflects that, but somebody else caught something I didn't. It's why community's good. Because mm -hmm. if we're exploring philosophical or, you know, untangible things, more minds are better because different experiences and more experience and less experience yield different results. And mm -hmm. I think that helps us carve a more uh, clear path. You know, we can explore a, like philosophical map and a much more thorough aspect. Yeah. 
and speaking of community. I love community. Um, he, he goes next to talk about how we put different values in a hierarchy. Uh-huh. Um, he says this hierarchy has been has been and currently is shaped by endless loops of effective feedback as the means and goals chosen by each individual and the society at large are modified by the actions and reactions of society in the uh, eternally interdictable experience of the unknown itself. So pretty much what he is saying here is that the the hierarchy that we have is always being changed mm-hmm. because of people in the society and the society at large trying different things yeah. and acting in different ways. And then, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, you could look at, you'll probably come up with something better than me, but gunpowder mm-hmm. being used, like they figured out better and better ways to use it just by people trying it in different ways. Yeah. So it kept getting more and more effective. Mm-hmm. He's saying that that happens with all values. Yeah, like people. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like if you think about the founding of the country, as mm-hmm. the country develops and grows, like we reevaluate the importance that we find in it. You know what? Here's a better example. As like guys and gals, mm-hmm. when you're in a relationship that doesn't work out, you've learned what works and what doesn't. Because not every relationship is like, I hate every aspect of the person. If that's the case, I'm sorry. And you're probably being a little dishonest with yourself. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, I mean, think about it. Like, you're not, you're, you don't just typically, you don't just walk into your first relationship and it's like, oh, that's perfect. No. And that's, I think that's why it's important to date when you're in, you know, high school and stuff, because I think that's a good time you're learning. And I think it's good Mm -hmm. life experience. But more importantly, as you, go on dates and as you get to know people and then, you know, break up or, or however you want to do it, maybe you do two dates and you're like, ah, I'm, you know, wishy-washy. You learn what you like and you don't like. And that's how you develop the importance that you place on like the person you end up marrying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had a much larger scale example. Gunpowder. Uh, now when I came up with on the spot, I didn't like it. Oh, okay. It was uh, bad. <laughs> I did talk about the church. Uh-huh. Christian church in general. Sure. Um, or the religion, I guess, Mm -hmm. the Christian community since its inception. Sure. Uh, I said the church has changed over time, but the message is from the same source that has existed for over 2,000 years. Yeah. Um, And I thought that was interesting or important to point out because this idea of like a feedback loop Mm -hmm. where things are changing and changing and changing. Yeah. Yeah. It can be helpful to understand some things, um, but one is that one problem is that it ultimately assumes that there's always going to be progress, mm-hmm. which is not the case, right? Because people can assume the wrong things, and it can get worse and stuff. So in a feedback loop, yeah, right, for sure. Um, and then it doesn't really apply to, in my opinion, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I don't think it applies to the church because stuff has changed like what we focused on over time the meaning of different documents or like different books in the bible and stuff and different passages um you know like baptism the importance of it um circumcision was a big debate um so i think that it's changed because of the christians or people involved in mm-hmm. the religion um but the message itself has always been the same yeah i mean I think it's unfortunate because if we look back in history, there's a lot of things that different churches and denominations like, like the Catholic church was saying that if you don't get baptized, you don't go to heaven. And that's just Mm -hmm. not true. But that was something that they used to like profit off way early when the Catholic Mm -hmm. church started. It's unfortunate because I feel like it sets us back, you know? Yeah. But I think that also goes back to the point I was trying to make, which is that, you know, when God was, um, God and Jesus, when, when they were, um, making the story in our lives to create the Bible and they were, you know, um, guiding the disciples and stuff. And they're writing these stories. They're not just writing the stories and Jesus isn't telling the parables just for the people there. They're telling for the people at that time and Mm -hmm. for the times that will come, Mm -hmm. which for us, it looks like the times that were the times that are and the times that will be Mm -hmm. because in 50 years, 
the Bible can't all of a sudden become obsolete. That doesn't work. It has to keep working beyond our lives. And it was designed to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just another proof or another piece of evidence that the Bible is written by a perfect being, i.e. God, because there's no way in heck could we as people write a story so perfect and with these perfect morals and these perfect values and these perfect parables and, and stuff. And imperfect people. And imperfect, yeah. And there's there's just no way. And uh, we were listening to that podcast in the car and they were talking about Superman. And like mm -hmm. Superman's unrelatable because he's too perfect. And they were like, we like imperfect people. And I was like, that's another point that I've made before. And I'll make again because it's a great point. God's perfect. It's hard to be relatable to a perfect being. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that we don't try to be relatable with him, but that we look to him for guidance and we look up to him as an example. Mm -hmm. That's the important distinction. Look at other mythologies. We talked about this. They're subject to vices. They're subject to imperfections. It's relatable, but it's not what we need. Mm -hmm. We need a high, a high level guide. Yeah. We need perfect to look to because even if you... Even if you walked up to somebody in church and you've gotten to know them a lot and you're like, this has got to be a perfect individual. They're not. And mm -hmm. they know that. And God knows that. But the reason they look that way is because they look to perfection to get there. Yeah. It's really good. Thank you. I try. <laughs> I do want to um, throw in the thing. It doesn't take too long to talk about or explain, but the thing our friend was saying. But if you have another quote or something else. um, No, we're good. Okay. I mean, I always, I have more obviously, but yeah. So we, he, he was texting me and then he called me on the phone and he was just like, bah. but he said, and I'm going to butcher this. Okay. And I'm sorry, but you know, he's smart. <laughs> so he's asked if chaos and order exist exclusively. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he was like, well, do you think that they can only exist like chaos exists in chaos and order exists in do order? Do you mean mutually exclusive? Yes. Like they can't exist together? Correct. Okay. I think. But so in the way that this is how, he, this is what he said that helped me understand. It. Okay. Um, he said, do you think there is something, and he changed it from chaos in order to known and unknown. So that's where I'm going to, but that's the term I'm going to use. Mm -hmm. He said, do you think there is something that is unknown that you think you know, but do not? And is there stuff that you, th that you think you don't know, but you do? And I just thought that was a really interesting thing to kind of sink on. We talked about this in my political science class. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I don't remember who it was. I, it was one of the Bush administration. I think it was the secretary of state for the Bush administration mm -hmm. during the Iraq war. Okay. Um, he said that we have knowns, we have unknowns, we have unknown knowns. And we have unknown unknowns and we have known unknowns. <laughs> so that wasn't the, that's a paraphrase, but mm -hmm. there's things that we know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. There's things that we don't know. We know. I think that is true. Yeah. Um, there's things we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. And there's things we know. We know. And it, it's so wild because I, it ties beautifully into what we just talked about mm -hmm. because it's like in order to say you've discovered chaos, you've discovered the unknown and made it known is an assumption you've made. Yeah. And, but we have to do it in order to survive because if we don't eventually make the assumption that we've turned the unknown into the known, we'll be so enveloped in the unknown that like we'll never move on. Mm -hmm. So like we have to make a sign. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know can you imagine writing a book that like ties together <laughs> i know <laughs> sometimes you open these things and i'm like where is this going but it's good stuff um let's see let me see if there's more we want to get through real fast mm -hmm. i think probably not really well we start getting into moral philosophy mm-hmm um yeah no i think we're at a good spot perfect next time we're gonna get into how philosophy is dependent on mythology mm -hmm. um and like explicit moral codes versus implicit moral codes that are in narratives and stuff so 
Oh, Inertis. I like Inertis. Mm -hmm. So do you have anything else to, to close with? <clears throat> Any? Thoughts? I don't. Did all of that make sense? I think it did. Okay. Then I'm satisfied. As long as you were good. I think I'm good. Uh, so that everyone knows, we are going to try to do shorter episodes. Yes. If you want to talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, we want to give you the most content we can and reviewing our kind of uh, audience engagement. Um, I think when we post things that are an hour and 20 minutes long, it's daunting. But posting something that's about 45 minutes long is far less daunting. And I think we both just want to get into the content and then talk about things like we're talking right now and other things and do like mm -hmm. channel updates or, or whatever like that. But we hope you liked this and we hope the 45 minute format's a little bit more digestible. And I hope we were a little bit more engaging this time. Do you have uh, anything else you want to say? Merry Christmas. Sorry. We didn't wear hats. Yes. Merry Christmas. For those, for the hats. for those who are listening on Spotify or any other podcast. We are wearing hats. Yes. If you can't see us, we are wearing hats. Um, Just imagine it. Absolutely. Us with hats. And then boom. Yeah. That's all I got, though. All right. <laughs> that, that felt quick. That yeah. was good, though. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, if Evan's got nothing else to say, I'll say this. Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.